All right, very last example of graphing sine and cosine. We're just going to focus on sine, but the same trick applies for cosine as well when we reflect. So when we reflect sine or cosine, all we have to do is switch the minimums and the maximums in the order of key points. So for sine, sine is always axis max, axis min, axis, when we reflect a sine value, that means we see a negative on the front, we are going to switch the max and mins so that the new order of key points for sine um, is axis min, axis max, axis. And then the same can be said for cosine. If cosine starts max, axis min, axis max, switch the maximums and minimums in those key points cosine, um, the reflection of cosine would then start at its minimum, hit the axis, go up to the maximum axis, and then end back at the minimum. So just flip the min and max and you guys will have it down for reflections. So the very last one, I hope you guys did uh, the for you to do's numbers three and four to practice the vertical and horizontal shifts there. And then there's two more practice problems after this. The answer key will be posted online for you guys to check those. Okay, negative 2 sine of 2 thirds x minus pi over 2. That's the function we're graphing here. Let's talk about the sinusoidal axis. So we don't have a um, vertical shift. We're not going up or down. There is a plus 0 technically sitting on the outside there. So y is equal to 0 is our sinusoidal axis. The amplitude is the number in front of sine or cosine. In this case, it's 2. Like I said, when we're talking about reflections, that's a completely different thing to add to the graph. Amplitude will always remain positive. The maximum then is going to be 0 plus 2, same thing, sinusoidal axis plus the amplitude. And the minimum, again, same thing, sinusoidal axis minus the amplitude. So negative 2 there is our minimum. Our frequency, always the number in front of x that we would multiply x by. That is 2 thirds in this case. Again, I've given it to you guys in a really nice way. I've factored it out already. Remember, we always want the coefficient of x to be 1 here if we've got a phase shift so that we can identify the phase shift correctly. Our period then, the standard period 2 pi radians divided by the frequency, and that ends up being 3 pi. It's a weird one. All right, and our subinterval length is always the period divided by 4. So 3 pi over 4 is our subinterval length. Now our phase shift comes from what we're adding or subtracting from x. So in this case, we're subtracting pi over 2. That means that we are moving to the right pi over 2. I will express moving right pi over 2 by saying our phase shift is positive pi over 2 or plus pi over 2. Now remember that we always, always start at the phase shift, and then we count by the sub-interval length. So we start at pi over 2. That's our phase shift. And we're going to add 3 pi over 4 in order to get to the next key point. We add the subinterval length. Now, those we need to find a common denominator for. This is 2 pi over 4 plus 3 pi over 4. So the next key point then is 5 pi over 4, the x value. Okay, keep moving. Add another 3 pi over 4, that is 8 pi over 4. And then another 3 pi over 4 is 11 pi over 4. And then another is 14 pi over 4. So those are the first uh, five key points x value wise. Now let's talk about those y values. Now those are coming from the reflection of sine. We've got that negative sign in front, which means that the order of key points is now axis min, axis max axis. So we move from the axis down to the minimum first. So the axis is zero, the minimum is negative two, back to the axis zero, up to the maximum two, and then we end back at the axis. So I'm going to draw and scale my x-axis, and then I'm going to come back and I will walk you through how we do the y-axis. This is one of my favorite problems because this is going to make it a little bit more complicated. So draw and scale your x-axis. Make sure to include at least one negative point. Don't drop your y-axis. I'll do that with you guys. Okay, we're back. We've got the x-axis completely scaled. Now, here is exactly why I have said draw the x-axis, scale it, and then drop the y. If you look at the points here, 
we do not have zero. There is no place or no nice place for the y-axis. And that means we will not have a key point sitting on the y-axis. We're going to kind of like skip over it. So the best we can do right now is draw where that y-axis would come in. So the y-axis is going to come in somewhere between negative pi over 4 and pi over 2. It'll be closer to negative pi over 4. I am going to purposefully not draw it on a nice line just because, like, it's not nice. All right? I could probably put it here. But we're not going to have a key point on the y-axis. We still need to include it, though. All right, and then we're going to make sure that we get our minimums and our maximums to fit. I'll put 2 here, and I'll put negative 2 down here. And then our sinusoidal axis is y is equal to 0. Sketch in that horizontal line, and then let's graph the key points. Okay, we always start at the phase shift, so find pi over 2. That's going to be where we start and we're starting on the sinusoidal axis. So we have a point on sinusoidal axis. Now, because we're graphing the reflection of sine, we're going to then move down to the minimum and then axis and now up to the maximum. Axis, min, axis, max, axis. Okay, so we hit all those points along the x-axis. Now we have to go to that negative pi over 4. So from pi over 2, the next key point would be the maximum. So negative pi over 4 is going to be the maximum. We don't have a point, a key point, on the y-axis. We will cross the y-axis, but we don't have a nice key point on the y-axis. And that was because be our phase shift and our sub-interval length our values such that we never get zero when we add or subtract the subinterval length from the phase shift. All right, that is your curve. That is it. Finish up those examples on the back, which are five and six. Those answers are posted um, on the answer key on the website.